The Adeptis Custodes come in smaller units for a more specialised and strategic 40k game, which can be perfect for using them to paint an entire army. Unlike something like Tyranids or Orcs, which are a horde army and have a lot of models that we need to paint, we can focus more on a smaller number of models with a Custodes army. So with that in mind, I thought it'd be worth going over and seeing how I would paint one of these armies on a scheme that we can do that can be replicated across an entire army. We'll be jumping in with this red and gold scheme. My name's Ben, this is the mini painting page, and to start off, we're going to want to use a zenithal highlight. What this will do is make sure that our future steps are brighter because we're working from a light undercoat, as well as helping the recesses be dark so that we don't have to worry as much and it will give us a rough guide on where to place our highlights later. We are going to be, however, starting off with the fabrics. We're going to be looking at the robes and the cloak and we want to make them a nice bright red. To start off, we want to grab a mid to mild blue color and then make sure that we thin this down so it's more of a glaze and just starts to stain the surface. We can take this, thin it down, as I said, and put in some thin shadows all over the recesses on the robe. What this will do is help to add some color definition and color variance within the shadows themselves, rather than just relying on the black from the zenithal highlight that we did at the start. With our shadows done, we can move across to the other areas remaining on the robe, which are showing the undercoat. Here, most of this should be the white areas, and we can take a bright red and go around and apply a consistent base coat across all of the areas that we have not yet tinted blue. This also allows us to spend a little extra time layering if we want to, so that we can build up between the blue shadows to the red base coat that we're now applying. And as always, that's just an exchange of time for the end result. Once we've gone around and got everything else base coated in this red, we need to keep the bright red out, but also dig out a darker red contrast paint, which we will be using for wet blending. Normally, I don't tend to say an exact paint that you have to do, or if I do, I say that naturally it can be sorted out for any color, but there may be some difference on properties depending on the paint that you're using. However, personally here, I found that wet blending using these contrast paints is quite useful if you're trying to get a nice gradual blend because they stay wetter longer than normal acrylics and we don't have to add any extra mediums or retarders to help us achieve nice wet blends. However, if you'd rather use a normal acrylic paint rather than a contrast paint itself, feel free to do that as well. With that in mind, let's take a pot of Blood Angels red contrast paint and the brighter red we used for the initial base coat so that we can wet blend these together. To achieve this in a quick way, what we can do is put down a reasonably thick layer of the darker red contrast and then come in with a fresh brush and grab some of that nice brighter red and mix it into all of the raised areas on the model. Pulling these colors together from the raised areas down into the shadows and giving them a mix between should give us a nice quick transition from the upper red highlighted areas down to the shadows, which thanks to the combination of the glaze and contrast will have tinted to a nice purple tone. While this wet blend may get us most of the way there and may even be suitable for some of our standard troops, for models that we want to spend that little bit of extra time on or even characters, what we can do is take a couple of extra steps in order to just push those colors a little bit more and just give it a little bit more of a boost when it's on the tabletop. What we want to do is start off by adding a couple of layers. The first one being the initial bright red that we used throughout the process. We can thin this down and add multiple thin coats across the edges of the robe as well as the most upper raised areas. What this will do is give us a nice clean bright red robe with a nice saturated shadow. We can then mix in a little bit of yellow to this original red and come in and highlight all of the edges with this new orange color. The reason that I would suggest using a orange which is a mix of yellow and the red that we've been using is because that way the colors are already harmonized together due to the presence of the red and we're not adding a new color in by just grabbing an orange off the shelf. However, if you don't have a yellow available and you've only got an orange, feel free to use that. It should work just as well. That is the robes and the cape sorted, meaning there are a couple other areas we need to tackle before we move on to the armor on the model. Here, what we're going to be looking at first is the furs on the model, and we're going to be using the benefit of washes to tackle this. Because we've used a zenithal highlight or a zenithal prime on this model, we can take advantage of these washes tinting it more than if we'd used another color. 
and we're going to be using a combination of black washes and flesh washes. We can start off with the flesh wash on the extremities and then as we move towards the face of this part of the model and the fur near there, we can switch into a black wash. This will help to pick out all of the textures across the fur by nature of it being a darker wash and by working quickly and pulling those colours back and forth in separate directions across the fur, we can get a nice transition from the two tones having a darker wash around the face, going to that warmer reddish tone around the pores. In this case, we can then leave it to dry and move on to grabbing a golden brown and set to work on the individual hair details. For highlighting this hair, we do have a few options. The first and probably quickest would just be to do a dry brush of the golden brown. And the other option would be to do what we're doing here and come in and paint every single hair individually with the golden brown. This is just a case of working across the area with the right consistency of paint so that we leave a nice clean line without needing to come back and do multiple passes so that it's not so thin that it washes into all of the recesses. In some of the areas where all of the hair flows in the same direction, we may be able to catch multiple areas at one pass by using our brush adjacent to the angle of hair similar to how we would normally edge highlight a surface. With all the individual hairs picked out, we can look to painting the face of the lion. And this is going to be using a mix of our original gold brown that we've used for the fur, as well as a darker brown that we'll be mixing in. And we'll be using these paints in roughly a 50-50 ratio mix. And we can lay down a clean, consistent base coat across the face, all of the other areas like the ears as well. And once this is dry, we can come in for our first layer. As this is the face and it's a large flat area, what we're going to try and do is simulate or recreate the effect of fur. To do this, we want to pick a direction that the fur will be going and using the original color we've used for the fur, so golden brown, we can come in and do lots of single directional lines across the entire face, bringing them closer together on the higher raised areas, which will give us more of a natural highlight. It's a case of working round, and once we've gone round the entire area, we can decide if there needs to be a second layer or if we should move across to the highlight. If we want the second layer, we can just go round and repeat the process. Otherwise, we can move on to the next paint, which is where we want to be grabbing a pale yellow or light bone and then mix that into the golden brown that we've been using so far and essentially undertake the same steps creating lots and lots of thin lines all across the face, focusing mostly on the higher sections for this color, but again, making sure the lines are always in the same direction. With the fur and face done, it just leaves us with the eyes, but I'm going to be doing that at the same time that I do the gems on the rest of the model. So therefore, we'll just come back to that at that point. This does mean that we can move on to some of the other odd appendage areas, such as the feather that they stick onto their chest. To start this off, what we're going to do is make a yellow base coat across the feather. And I've personally found that yellow contrast over a white base is one of the quickest way to lay down a base coat for this. And again, we just do this across the whole area, let it dry, and then we've got a nice yellow base coat. Once it is in that state, we can come in and do some highlighting using a pale yellow. We want to use this pale yellow to highlight all of the edges of the feather, pulling the color from the center into the edges across all of the sculpted details on there, making sure that we add to that feather-like feel of the part of that model and just pulling all of the colors towards the edges to make them a natural edge highlight. With the yellow dry, we can move on to a final highlight with a white paint. And what we can do is thin this down and as normal do some edge highlighting trying to make sure that we highlight in a thinner, finer line than we did with the yellow steps that we've done previously so that we get a nice crisp edge and a nice defined edge with this white. This will also help with the next steps, which is where we're going to come in with a wash to adjust the color of the feather to whatever we desire. Here, I'm going to just mute it down slightly because it's so close to the face. I didn't really want it detracting from that part of the model. So I'm going to drop the color down, but we can use different colored washes in order to get different effects and feathers in total. Here, I'm going to be using a flesh wash, which will help to blend all of the colors and tones that we've used so far, as well as helping to pick out all of those sculpted strands 
in a nice warmer shadow tone, which once dry means that we can move across to the face which is one of the last areas that are non-metallic. To start off with the face, what we're going to want to do is come in with either a pale brown or a dark flesh tone, and then add a layer of this base coat across all of the face, making sure to get all of the areas and recesses with this color. Then what we can do is come in with a follow-up once it's dry with medium flesh in order to start the first round of highlights. And here we want to go around and catch all of the raised sections on the face. We want to be sure to catch all the prominent features, the brow, the cheekbones, everything like that. Once this layer is dry, we can then come in with a final highlight. And here we're going to be using a brighter, lighter flesh tone than what we used on the previous steps. Taking this, we're going to do some final highlights on the most raised upper areas, catching ideally smaller areas than we did on the last round. Once this is dry, we may feel that it's slightly too bright or too desaturated. And in order to fix this, we can apply some washes, either using a flesh wash or an earth wash, and apply that across all of the face, bringing back those details. If we want a slightly warmer tone, we can come in with a flesh wash, while the earth wash will give us more of a ruddy tone or ruddy appearance to the face. This just leaves us with the hair on the face to go, and for this model, it has graying hair. To pull this off, what we'll be doing is a black base coat, which once down, we can start to use a bright flesh in the same method and manner as we did for the lines on the lion's face. We can take this white or this flesh tone and start to drag it from the center of the face away to the edges in multiple thin little lines. This will help to highlight the edges naturally, as well as giving us an impression of graying hair. This can then be followed up with a black wash, what this wash will do is help to desaturate the flesh tone that we've already put on, as well as darken the whole thing down, allowing us to come back in with the same flesh tone for a second round of lines for our highlights. By doing this, we can go round again, pulling all of the colors in exactly the same method as we did, but because we've now got the two tones on there from the washed version and the unwashed version, we have a brighter appearance overall, as well as a nice variance across the facial hair and the hair itself, so that we get that nice appearance of graying hair. This just leaves the eyes, and unfortunately all of the footage for this was terrible, so I can't really say much. It's just a case of painting them black, painting them white, and a lot of holding your breath. With all that done, it leaves us with just the largest area of the model, which is the metallics left. And the reason that we've left them till last is a couple of reasons. One, if we get metallics in an area that we don't particularly want them, trying to paint over them can sometimes be a nightmare and you do get a slight show through of the metallics through the base coat and further layers and they can take a little bit of time to correct. Whereas if we've already got that area painted and we accidentally get some metallics down, as long as we act quickly, flood the area and pull the brush away, we should be able to pull all of that off without much damage to the under layers. The second reason that we need to do it first is not necessarily in this paint job, but as good practice, if we were going to be applying a varnish or something similar to the model, that would affect the metallics, and therefore we want to be doing the metallics at the end, so that if we were to use a matte varnish or anything like that, our metallics aren't affected and all that work is wasted. To start off with the armor, we will be needing to grab a dark, rich tone gold, and we can use this to coat all of the areas of the armor getting all of those recesses and all of the raised filigree areas while trying not to get it on any other area. This is where subassemblies can come in quite handy because we can separate parts of the model, we can take the robe away from the armor panels and we don't have to worry about being as careful and avoiding those areas. If you've got it in one piece, it's not exactly an issue, you just need to take that little bit of extra time and care to make sure that we don't get gold on any areas that we've already painted. Once we've gone round and we've got this base coat of dark gold across the entire model and everywhere we want it, we can then come back in with a brighter gold or brassy tone and use this to pick out all of the areas where the light would be hitting the most. This is going to be all of those raised panels as well as any ridges or edges that the light would catch. We can then go a little step further and brighten up the gold with a mix of silver this will take some of the saturation out, but overall brighten up the color. And we can take this new mix and attack all of the filigree and all of the raised etchings that come on these Custodes models. 
They're all sculpted in and we can just highlight them with this mix. This will add some tone difference to these areas while still being aligned to the rest of the army thanks to the gold that we've been using. Once it is fully dry and we don't have to worry about any color bleeding, we can then come in with some flesh wash. And rather than applying this to all of the armor, we are going to be just targeting the areas that we've highlighted with this silver mix. This wash will help to tint that silver back to a golden hue, but also help to add some deep tone panel lines across all of those elements to give it a nice bit of definition. With that wash applied and dried, that means that the armor is done. If wanted and we do have a brighter gold available, we could go around and do some final extra edge highlights. However, for the majority of tabletops, this will be perfectly fine. We now also have the gems that are all across the armor and we're going to be painting them blue, just like the box art for the model. Starting with a mid blue, we can apply a base coat to each of the gems, making sure not to catch any of the armor that we've just painted that glorious gold. We can put down a nice base coat of this bluish gray. Once we've got all of the gems coated with this, we can come in with a couple drops of white. We want to catch two areas of each gem, we want the area facing the ideal viewing angle, so where we'll be looking from. We want one facing that area, and then we also want a matching one at the back of the gem on the reverse angle to show the light coming out of the other side from where we would be looking at it. Once the white is dry across all of these gems, we can take a bright blue contrast and then give this a dot over every single gem. This will tint the areas and bring down the darkness slightly, while preserving that glint of white from beneath. We can then also optionally apply a coat of gloss varnish, which will help to add to that reflectiveness without any additional work being needed from us. It's just dropping it in. That leaves us with the last items on the model, which is the odd items and weapons and things like that that they've got dotted around. So for the actual weapon, we're going to be starting with the shaft and we're going to start from a base coat of black and we can start this at the same time as painting the hair. It's just a matter of laying down a consistent and smooth base coat of black across the weapon haft and areas that we're going to be painting in this tone. Once the weapon shaft is coated in this black, we can go across and do some edge highlighting and we're going to be using a silver to do some edge highlighting and just work around and all of the edges of the black shaft will be highlighted in this silver to give us that quick metallic feel without any real time or effort. Just edge highlight every single little thing. Once this is all done and this black has had its highlight, we can pick out a few of the areas in silver or bronze so we can look at the barrel or the ammo and then give everything a black wash once this is all dry. This whole area will get the black wash which will help bring it all together, darken down the silvers and bring it in with the blacks. At this point, we can paint the handles in the same way we've painted other fabrics, just slapping down some red contrast and then some red wet blending just to give us the feel. And then we can move over and start on the power axe blade itself. There are many ways that we can paint power weapons, whether it's with glowing effects, lightning effects, or any various other means. Here, we're going to be using a blue lightning effect and we're going to be starting off from the white undercoat that we've got from the Zenithal and we're going to apply a known oil wash. This isn't essential, I just wanted to start from a slightly darker base coat and I thought this was the quickest way to achieve it. If you want a slightly lighter blade, you can just skip the known oil and work straight from the white base coat. What we want to do is, get once this is dry, come in with a pale flesh color and start to do some relatively broad highlights across the blade. Here, we are looking to catch all of the edges along the blade itself as well as the false edges down the center of the blade where it starts to thin. Once this has dried, we can go over the whole blade with the same color and coming in and doing some thin lines starting from the energy node and moving towards the edges of the blade to represent the power surge going through the blade. We are going to be doing this a couple of times. So if it's not the neatest on this particular version, it's not a major issue. However, if we can make neat jagged lightning bolts, it does sell the effect a little bit better. But don't worry if it's a little bit messy to start off with. What we want to do is once we've got these lightning bolts down and everything is dry, we can put down a wash of our chosen power weapon color. In this case, it's going to be a blue wash, applying a nice coat across the whole blade to tint everything that we've done so far. 
with that covered and completely dry so that we don't get any color mixing for the next steps. We can come back in with the light flesh that we used and make even more lightning patterns. Starting from the node, we can work out to the edge of the blade and then we can come in doing some edge highlighting. We don't want to place any of the broader strokes on this one, just the thinner lines on the edges of the blade as well as for the lightning effect. Again, what we want to do is wash the blade. However, rather than just using the blue wash we used the first time, we're going to add in a little bit of a brighter contrast paint into this wash, which will help to deepen some of the saturation on this particular pass, adding a little bit of variance to all of the lightning that we've done so far. Once again, we can apply this wash to the entirety of the blade, which will start to tint all of our past stages into a brighter blue tone, but with the latest fresh lines having a brighter start due to the contrast that we've added on this occasion. As always, we want to wait for the wash to completely dry, and once it is, we can come in with another set of lightning bolts using that light flesh tone that we've used so far. These again need to be even smaller and thinner than the last, cascading across the blade and also where the lightning hits the blade, we can do some slightly chunkier edge highlights there to give us that feeling of the energy impacting the edge of the blade. Then it's just a case of a final wash of the initial dark blue that we used without any of the contrast added in. Doing this across the entire blade will help bring the whole piece together and make it look like lightning is consistently arcing across the blade. Personally, I quite like this option, which is more subtle and darker. However, we can do an optional final edge highlight, picking out all of the brightest areas across the blade and the very top edges or hotspots of the blade. At this point, the model is essentially done. What we can do is put him back together if he's in sub-assemblies, mount him on a really nice space-themed marble base, and send him out to the tabletop. Honestly, I quite like this scheme. And if you have any comments, let me know down in the comments below. And it's honestly something that I think we could do relatively easily and without that many steps on a larger army. Talking about steps, if you're interested in how to make these space marble steps, maybe you'd be interested in this video here. Otherwise, please do remember to subscribe so that we can see you next time.